Good morning, church. Today's scripture uh, comes from Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour, and a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John, and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all of the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Amen. Throughout this act series, uh, we're taking a look at the church and really the story of how Jesus Christ built his church through the power of the Holy Spirit to take the gospel to the nations. Now, as I mentioned before, not everything that happens in Acts is going to be uh, our normal experience here. You see profound miracles on the day of Pentecost. We just heard about one of the profound miracles that God performed uh, among the people through Peter and John on this day. And yet, as we look at the church, we ought to recognize this is the power of God. This is how God has worked in the past, and we can hope that God would work this way in the future, that we could pray prayers of faith, uh, prayers believing that God has the ability to heal and to restore no matter what the circumstances are. Now, today, we're going to be looking at a text that, that there are three parts to this text. There's a man, there's a miracle, and there's a message. And I hope that in each of these things, you can ultimately uh, be encouraged for yourselves personally. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Acts chapter 3. We're just going to take a look at all three of these uh, events or these three things today. Uh, and then uh, we're going to conclude with what Peter ultimately says to the people in his message Acts chapter 3, verse 1, Peter and John were going up to the temple about the ninth hour. This is 3 o'clock in the afternoon. This is when every good Jew would have gone to the temple to pray. This was a customary thing. They would have done it day after day after day, normal life for them. And so Peter and John, they're going up. This is likely when the church would gather, and, and Peter and, and, and John or who, any of the apostles, they would preach and teach the church. So they're headed up to the temple about the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been lame from his mother's womb was being carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. Now, this is a, really, it's a sad state. This man's life, uh, it wasn't merely physical limitations here, uh, but this man had been born with some sort of illness. Uh, it, it describes his feet and his ankles in particular, so there was uh, either disease there, something was wrong with, within him, something broken, such that this guy from birth had never been strengthened to walk. And so I'm sure as a kid, he tried to stand just like you and I did. I mean, he tried to learn to walk, and uh, every time he tried, he, he'd fallen. He just wasn't able to do that. This was an ailment that he carried with him since birth. And now for over 40 years, this man, unable to walk, unable to work, unable to provide for himself, would have friends, people that cared enough about him or had enough pity on him, would carry him to this gate of the temple. Everyone else going in to pray, uh, this man has got to beg alms. Somebody going to pray before God would feel compassion for him, give him something. He would beg just to exist, just to be able to have enough food to survive the next day, just getting through life. But on this day, everything was going to change because there wasn't just a man, there was also 
a miracle. In verse 3, it says that when Peter and John, uh, when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. Now, don't think that this is like a lone guy sitting at this gate called Beautiful and a couple of guys walking by. This would have been a crowd of people and likely a whole crowd of beggars who would have been there. And they're all asking for alms. They all need to be supported. There's no social services there for them. There's no support, safety net in their culture. And so there would have been a, a crowd of beggars who'd all been brought there to beg alms on this day. There would have been a flood of people going into the temple to pray. And yet on this particular day, God does this miracle by the power of his Holy Spirit that Peter and John happen to connect with this guy and he happens to connect with them. So think about crowds of people, the beggar just scanning, hoping somebody will meet his eyes, that somebody will see him where he is, that somebody will feel compassion for him in his situation. And person after person is walking walking by, they're doing what you and I often do, like you don't want to meet their eyes, the guy that's standing at the corner, you know, with the sign, you're driving by, you're like, ooh, don't want to make eye contact, because then it's, then it's awkward, and I'm going to feel guilty if I don't help, and so on this day, Peter and John, they don't turn away. As their eyes meet his, they invite, they say, hey, look, look at me, focus on me, it's probably he was scanning the crowds looking for somebody else. So they invite him to focus on him. Verse 4, Peter said, uh, along with John, he fixed his gaze on him and said, look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. He wanted to eat. He just wanted to make it through another day, right? hoping to receive alms. In verse 6, Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold. But what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. Now, this must have been profoundly unexpected for this man. And honestly, he probably was a little bit disappointed when they uttered that phrase that he'd probably heard 10,000 times. Oh, silver and gold, I don't have any, sorry. But on this day, as his eyes meet theirs, Peter says, what I have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I want you to get up and walk. He reaches down his hand, seizing him by the right hand. Peter raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. And with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. Now, sometimes our distance, historical distance, we're 2,000 years removed from this miracle. Uh, we're also a couple thousand miles removed from the place, right? So we're, there's a lot of physical distance and distance and time. We can lose sight of what just happened here. But I want you to imagine that you'd grown up next to this kid. That you felt the heartbreak of seeing him day after day, unable to play with his friends, unable to go out and interact, unable likely to go to school. And as you got older, he didn't have a girlfriend, right? He's not going to get married away. He's not developing a skill that he might work and support himself. Like day after day, you'd seen this guy, unable to walk. Unable to participate in all the aspects of life that everyone else seemed to be able to enjoy. There was this brokenness that was in him from birth that didn't allow him to engage and to enjoy life like everybody else got to. Instead, he had to sit there and beg. He was at the mercy of other people just to survive. And then here comes Peter. And he takes him by the right hand of this man who'd never walked in his entire life. His legs are strengthened. And he stands up with a leap. And here he goes, and he's running, he's jumping, he's leaping, he's praising God, and you'd known him. You had seen him throughout your life, and you know that a miracle has been done on that day. Anybody else watch those YouTube videos about the, the little babies that get the hearing aid for the first time? Y'all, I'm a man, I'm 40, and I still get misty-eyed, right? Here is this baby who's never experienced hearing before, and then they turn on that hearing aid and... Mom says, hey, you know, and he hears his mom and his dad's voice, and they're, usually the babies are like overwhelmed. Sometimes they cry because they just don't, they've never experienced that before. Y'all, this is the miracle that occurred, something so profound. A man who was lame from birth, he begins to walk, and he's overwhelmed. 
And so he's not doing what you're supposed to do in the temple, right? I was taught my entire life you don't run in church, and he did it, right? He's running, and he's leaping, and people are just in awe of what has happened with this man. And they're, they're, they've got to be asking, like, well, how did this, how does, what did he take? You know, I want some of that for me. I've got this pain. And I mean, there had to be discussions about how this man was healed. This man was healed by the power of Jesus' name, y'all, by the power of God working through his church. And his life was forever changed. It wasn't with some physical means, not that God can't use those. It wasn't with silver or gold on this day. It wasn't Peter and John giving them something they didn't have, but they just gave this man what they did. And his life is forever changed. Verse 8, with a leap, he stood upright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with him, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. The story begins with just the picture of a man who's in a sad state. He's kind of desperate. But then we're told of a miracle. The man was healed. He enters into the temple and he's just shouting and leaping and praising God like, look what God's done for me. And everyone around can't help but take note. He's decided he's going to hang out with Peter. These guys are onto something. He's interested in what they have going. And so in verse 11, we, we get that he's clinging to Peter and John. And all the people ran together to them at the so-called portico of Solomon. This is Solomon's colonnade. This is where they would have preached every single day. The church would have gathered. And they were full of amazement when Peter saw this. Now, this could have been a moment for Peter and John, just for the record. I mean, if you're the guy that just reaches down and takes someone by the hand and suddenly they're strengthened and can walk, uh, this was an opportunity for Peter to raise his social status quite a bit. He wasn't a learned man. He wasn't terribly respected among the people. There would have been a level of scorn because he was a Galilean. He talked like a redneck, right? That's who Peter was. But he chooses not to put the spotlight on himself. Instead, he puts the spotlight on, on Jesus. Peter saw this. He replied to the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or, or why do you gaze at us as if, if by our own power or piety we had made him walk? He uses a phrase that would have been very familiar with every single person listening in that day, every person of the temple. He's like, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant, Jesus. He's like, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you're, you're God. The one that you've given your life to serving, the one that your fathers worshipped, the God of all the prophets, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. He's the one that did this. But then he points them toward Christ. The God of our fathers has glorified his servant Jesus, the one who you delivered to be disowned in the presence of Pilate, whom he, who had decided to release him. But you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. You know, the story is Jesus is with Pilate. He offered to release Barabbas, a, a murderer, an insurrectionist, or Jesus, and they chose Barabbas instead. You asked for a murderer to be granted to you, but put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And on the basis of faith in his name, it is the name of Jesus which has strengthened this man whom you see and know. And the faith which comes through him has given him his perfect health in the presence of you all. You want to know how this miracle happened? You don't want to know where this came from? This, this miracle came from God. This miracle came from the God that, that they all worshipped. They all would have known the same God that they'd worshipped their entire lives, the same God who sent Jesus. And then he's going to give them a clearer explanation of the gospel. In verse 17, And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers also did. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he as thus fulfilled. Can I read you one of the prophets? 
Can I read you from the prophet Isaiah just to get a little bit of a picture? Because these were Jews, and they would have known the prophets. They would have understood like what Isaiah was talking. They would have known everything that any of the prophets, they would have had it in their minds. They studied it their whole lives, and yet they had missed the Messiah. So Peter, you want to know who performed this miracle? It was God who also sent Jesus, who was the fulfillment of God's prophecy. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah. Listen, Jesus was the guy that they were all pointing to. And so I want to read to you from Isaiah chapter 53, just one of the prophecies that they would have known. Isaiah chapter 53, beginning in verse 3, says, He was despised and forsaken of men. He was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging or by his stripes we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray and each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Him. Peter's like, you remember what the prophet said? You know the words of the prophecy about a Messiah? And that was Jesus. And he's caused the sin of us all to fall upon him. The things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Peter preaches the gospel to a group of Jews who spent their whole life studying the Old Testament. That, like, when you think about being a Jew, everything is centered around God. And his law and the worship of him and observing the sacrifices. These are men and women who would have understood uh, the sacrifice, the sacrificial system. They knew what it meant. Every single year since the time of their birth, they had watched on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, as they would take a pure, spotless, cute little lamb. And they would slaughter that lamb in front of all the people. They watch as that pure, spotless lamb, the life slipped away from it. Its blood was shed. They understood the weight of their sin. That in order for the remission of sins, for sins to be remitted, blood had to be shed. So they weren't so much like you and I. We're like, oh yeah, sin, no big deal. That was a little white lie or whatever. What they knew is that sin required a blood sacrifice that their sins were so weighty that something had to die. And so here on this day, Peter is proclaiming that Jesus is the Messiah, the Lamb of God, whose blood was shed so that their sins could be forgiven. He's just told, you're the one who crucified the Messiah. But listen, God knew about this in advance. And God loved the Jews Enough that even though they crucified his son, he still sent Jesus to die, that their sins might be forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so Peter, upon preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, the goodness of God, this love of God who found them in their sin and still chose to die for them, this overwhelming love of God that while Jesus was on the cross, he was praying, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they do to these Jews. Peter preaches a very simple little message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he calls on them in verse 19 to repent and return. We talked about repentance last week. That means turning away from sin, the life that they'd been living, the things they'd been pursuing, all the the idols they might have otherwise served in their life, the things they'd been depending upon, and instead to turn to Jesus Christ. And so today that call is repeated. It's the same message Peter preached before. He says, repent and return. Return to God. 
Like you may not have even realized that you'd slipped away from God to the, to the Jews. You may not have realized you were acting in ignorance when you crucified the Messiah. Now repent of your sin and turn back to God. Begin to follow him. Don't trust in your righteous works anymore, but trust in Jesus. And then Peter gives him four reasons that they should repent in return. The first is there in verse 19. He says, therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away. The burden of the law was heavy on the Jews. It took a lot of focus. I don't know if you've read much of the Old Testament, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, like the law. Uh, there are a lot of laws, like hundreds. And they would have spent like all of their time, they, like trying to make sure they were obeying the laws. They'd been taught them since they were young kids, and the law was kind of always with them. It was like a burden on their shoulders. And every single year, they would offer these sacrifices, and the lamb would have to die for their sins, and it was their fault, right? And there was this burden on their shoulders because they were never right with God because the day after the day of atonement, right, you've sinned again. And Jesus had made it that much worse because he said, listen, it's not just if you murder someone. If you've had those thoughts in your heart, you're a murderer. It's not just if you physically commit adultery. If you looked at a woman with lust, you're an adulterer. And so the weight of sin was heavy on their shoulders. And they could go through all the right motions. They could do all the right things, but they were never cleansed of their guilt. And so here is Peter saying, listen. The Lamb of God has come, the one who takes away the sins of the world, not just for this moment, not just this one-time deal, but once for all, Jesus is here. The Messiah has come to take away the sins of the world. Listen, our sin creates this distance between us and God. It separates us from Him. And the Jews would have lived their entire lives separated from God. They were doing the best that they could to obey the law and to honor God with their lives, and yet their sin was a barrier. But Jesus stepped in, having lived that perfect, pure life, offered himself as a sacrifice, and God caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. There on the cross, Jesus bore the just penalty for our sin. He shed his blood on our behalf that our sins might be forgiven. So Peter says, repent of your sin and turn your life back to God. And you got so caught up in Judaism and all the, the legalism of living according to law that you missed the Messiah. Repent and return that your sins may be forgiven. Jesus says this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, come to me, all you are, who are weary and heavy laden. And the Jews had spent their whole lives trying to observe the law, and it would have been heavy on their shoulders. And Jesus says, no, 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 come to me, and I will give you rest for your souls. When your sins are forgiven, the past and the present and the future, and you no longer have to strive, you no longer have to carry the weight of trying to save yourself and keep the law and earn salvation from God, it has been given, and you can rest in Christ Jesus. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. So Peter says, repent and return, that your sins may be forgiven, that that thing that separates you from God, that dividing wall of sin can be taken away, that you can know God and walk before him with your, your souls at peace and your souls at rest with God. But that's not all. We repent and return so that sins will be forgiven but also so that we may be renewed. There in verse 19, Therefore repent and return so your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, this was confusing to me when I first read it. Like, uh, what is this times of refreshing thing that might come from the Lord as a result of repentance and returning to Him? The, the Greek word is anapsuxis. Y'all can... Uh, take that home with you. Uh, and upsuxus, it means to be revived or renewed or recovery of breath. You know the word for Holy Spirit? It's the same word for breath. It's pneuma. And what, he, what he's telling them is, listen, 
Repent and return to the Lord that your sins could be taken away and that you may be filled with the Holy Spirit who revives and renews and who leads you to abundant life in Him. That we might be renewed in the power of the Spirit. That no longer do we live according to the weakness of our flesh, but rather we have new life and new power in Him. He's telling the Jews, like, and you've been living your whole life working so hard. And the weight of law is crushing because it was supposed to be. It was supposed to make you conscious that you needed a Savior. And the Savior has come. Now repent and return to them that your sins might be forgiven. That you might be empowered by the Holy Spirit. That you might experience that His mercies are new every single day. That you might experience the, the filling of the Holy Spirit which will empower you to live the lives that God has called you to live. That you might live in this abundant life rather than going through life half dead in the weakness and in the brokenness of your sinful flesh, that you might live in the power of the Spirit. So repent and return. But he's not done yet. He gives them four total reasons. He says, repent and return for the forgiveness of sins, and repent and return that you might be renewed in Christ Jesus. But in verse 20, he tells them something that's really important. He tells them that Jesus is going to come back. And he's speaking about the second coming. They Obviously, he'd already referenced the crucifixion of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 20, he says, that he may send Jesus, the Christ, appointed for you. Jesus is coming back for his people. And he talks in the next verse about this appointed time. He says, For whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. He's like, you know the prophets. You know that he's going to come back. You know that Jesus is going to return. And he's going to redeem his people for himself fully. While we might be saved here on this earth, we still live in these broken and fleshly bodies in this broken and sinful world. And Jesus is one one day going to come back and he's going to redeem and restore all things. So repent and return for the forgiveness of your sins. Repent and return that you might be renewed in the power of the Holy Spirit. Repent and return because Jesus is coming back. And and there's a part of this that's really important for us. And we all look forward to heaven. And we all look forward to, you know, a new heaven, new earth, like new bodies, the whole bit. But there's something important to remember about that day. And that's the fourth thing that Peter tells us about here. The fourth thing is he tells us to repent and return because judgment awaits all men. Verse 22 He begins to quote Moses here. Moses said, The Lord God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. To him you shall give heed to everything he says to you. There's a prophet coming that you should give heed to everything he says to you. Verse 23, And it will be that every soul that does not heed that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Repent and return so that you might receive forgiveness of sin. Repent and return so that you might be renewed in the power of the Holy Spirit. Repent and return because Jesus is coming back. Repent and return because judgment awaits all men. When Jesus returns, there are going to be two groups of people. There are those who have come to know Jesus Christ who have received his forgiveness, who have come to be recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ and of the Holy Spirit, and then there are those who have not. And judgment awaits. Now, this should shake us. Because here, 2,000 years later, we live in a world, we often live as if Jesus isn't going to return. And that is if no judgment awaits. And we distract ourselves with so many other things. And yet on that day and in the moment of judgment, there's only one thing that will matter. And that's whether you repented and you return. Did you heed the words of Jesus Christ Did you enter into his salvation and into his grace? 
It should shake us for ourselves. The, the people he's talking to, these are ethnic Jews who are religious in so many ways. Y'all, they made us look weak. Y'all, their devotion man, it made us look like slackers, like they were all in for their faith. Yet in the Sermon on the Mount, his inaugural sermon in this world, Jesus says, hey, I want to warn you about something. In that day, when I return in the day of judgment, there's going to be a lot of people that say to me, hey, Lord, Lord, did we not do some religious things in your name? Hey, Jesus, one time I walked an aisle and I prayed a prayer. Jesus, I went to church. I was a pretty good old gal, pretty good old boy. There was this cultural aspect to Jewishness that they thought automatically kind of made them in. If I do what everyone else around me as a Jew is doing, if I go to the temple and I pray, and I participate in all the rituals and sacrifices, the holy days, then I'm going to be good with the Lord. And Jesus says, hey, you need to know that many of those people are going to hear not, hey, welcome into my kingdom, but they're going to hear the word depart. I never knew you. This should shake us for ourselves because we live in a culture, it's certainly different from that of Jewishness, but we live in the South where everybody's a Christian, right? And it's easy to kind of adopt the ways that Christians live in many ways. And we can go to church. We can walk an aisle and pray a prayer and get wet in a baptistry. We can have the right beliefs. We can vote for the right party. We can proclaim the right values, champion the right causes. But the real question that we have to ask ourselves today is, do we know Jesus Christ? And if we made him the Lord of our lives, have we heeded the words of the prophet? Have we made our lives obedient to the teaching of Jesus, have our hearts been transformed within us? Do we walk with him in a relationship with him where our lives are yielded? If you remember the early church, those first believers that we heard about just, just a couple, the past couple of weeks, like their lives were dramatically transformed as a result of their faith in Jesus Christ. And what is so common in American Christianity is our, our lives are barely different. We change what we do for an hour or so on Sunday. But if you look at Christians in the midst of our culture, we're no different. So this should shake us. The words of Peter that he was preaching to devout Jews. It should shake us for ourselves. Moms and dad, it should shake you for your home. That we should examine ourselves to see whether we are in the faith. And it should shake us for our city. For our neighbors and our friends and those that we sit next to at the ball games. And wouldn't it be a tragedy? If we sat next to him week after week after week. We lived next to him year after year after year. We never told them that God sent his son Jesus Christ to suffer and die on their behalf. That when he comes back in the judgment, they don't have to spend eternity separated from him in a place called hell. That they could be in heaven. That they could experience a renewal today. In Jeremiah chapter 6, it describes a situation not unlike ours. It talks about the people there that they had sinned so much they don't even blush anymore. They're no longer ashamed of their sin. They don't hide it. It's rather public. What was worse is that God's people, who were supposed to represent him, who were supposed to point people back to him, to, to his word and his ways, they were dealing falsely with the people. Rather than speaking the truth, they were declaring peace, peace, when there was no peace. Peace. They were going about their lives as if everything was fine, as if the people of God were just right on track, as if you know, the whole of society was doing just fine before God. They didn't care about their sin. They need not worry about it. And the prophets were like, no, 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 God's good. And God loves you. They didn't tell them that Jesus was coming. And ultimately, they were going to stand before him one day. They didn't tell him to repent. And return to God. 
Church, I hope it's not us. That we would waste our years and our days and our lives going through everyday motions, pretending like everything's fine when it's not fine. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are his prophets and his priests. We are the people of God who are here to represent him well. So we should examine ourselves. Do I know Jesus Christ? Am I really following after him? Does my life look like anything like these early believers? Man, am I devoting myself to him daily? Man, am I really pursuing Jesus Christ in the life of a disciple? Or am I just kind of living out Southern American Christianity, which may not be Christianity at all? If you know that you're in the faith, let me just challenge you. And to go out into a world and to proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. A few parallels in this story for us. Some of you, when you think about your life, you might feel a little bit like the man in the story. The paralytic. Crippled from birth. Maybe as you think about your life, man, there's something that you think, man, it's just something wrong with me. That unlike other people, I haven't been able to seem to walk. Maybe it's just this area. That for whatever reason, I've just never been able to stand on my own two feet here. There's this weakness. There's this brokenness in my life. And maybe you've tried everything to get rid of that addiction. You've tried everything to get away from that sexual sin. You've tried everything to get away from drugs. You've tried your hardest to be a really good person, but you could not walk on your own. And I want to just say to you today that there is power in the name of Jesus I don't settle for your own efforts anymore. That's what the Jews did. But would you just cry out to Jesus and say, I have this brokenness in my life and I need to be healed and restored because Jesus is still in the business of performing miracles. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the hope of the world. How much should our lives be like that crippled beggar who was running and leaping and saying, let me tell you about what Jesus has done for me. Your mess of your life, the brokenness, that pain, that's intended to be your message. That as you've heard the gospel and you've been transformed by Jesus, that he would want you to go and say, listen, I was a man who couldn't walk for 40 years, but Jesus changed everything in my life. Can we quit pretending? And we come into church like we're all cleaned up and we're all perfect and we all have it together. And the mess of our lives, that brokenness that Jesus Christ heals within us, That's supposed to be the message that we proclaim to the world. I doubt that crippled beggar knew the Pentateuch, could quote the Torah. But he could tell people what Jesus Christ had done for him. And that's our responsibility for the people. Maybe in the story, you're like Peter and John. Going to church, doing your thing. Would you just beg God today to help you see the people that you need to see? And you don't have to offer to God things that you don't have, but would you just offer to God the things that you do? As you see broken and hurting people in our city, would you take the moment to look at them, to see them, to have compassion on them, and just to say, God, I got nothing, but I know that you do. And maybe you sit down and you pray with them and you listen to them and you hear their story and maybe you invite them into your home. Maybe you care for them in that moment. But would you just offer yourself to God? Say, God, would you use me? And you use Peter. He denied even knowing you. Would you use me? And then the final piece of this is maybe you're like the Jews in the story. And your life's been really busy. And you've done all the religious things. You have heard the sermons. You could preach the sermon. You could share the gospel. You know the word. Would you hear his message today? And if you don't know Jesus Christ, would you just let today be the day that you repent and you return to the Lord? You cry out to Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. And you begin living your life in obedience to everything that he's commanded you. Would you bow your heads with me today? Man, if you're here today and you're like that beggar, and you got that thing in your life that you've not been able to shake, the thing that you can't overcome, you've been trying on your own, you've been fighting, and today you would just like somebody to pray for you, would you be so bold as just to raise your hand and say, hey, I've got the thing. I've got the bitterness. I've got the unforgiveness. I've got the hurt. I've got the pain. I can't seem to get through this. Would anyone raise their hand and say, Jason, would you just pray for me today? Would you lift your hand right now? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
God, in the name of Jesus Christ, not because of our power, not because of our strength, but in your name and your power and your strength. God, I pray for those who lifted their hands in this moment. And God, we pray for healing. God, we pray that they might learn to walk, that you would strengthen them, that you would give them victory over that thing in their life, that they would give it to you in faith. And God, that you would bring victory in their life over that specific sin. God, I pray that their lives would be given to obedience to you. And I pray that that mess, that thing that they may be so ashamed of, that they'd never want to admit right now, that that mess might become their message. And that they wouldn't just go to the church, but they would go to the world and say, let me tell you what Jesus has done for me.